You are now tuning in to Kickspot with Jidu Park and Mix. All right, you guys. Welcome to another episode of The Kick Spot. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we got some special guests in the house here. Very, very special. Uh, obviously, your guests, Mix Pajardo and Ginu Park. Yes, sir. Ginu Park here. Um, this actually is a, a very, very uh, exciting episode for us. We have Miss Alice Gu, which is the director. Is that correct? Director of DP, yes. Director and producer. Is that right? Director, yeah, producer, producer, and everything. Director of photography. Wow. Not everything, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, of the documentary called The Donut King, uh, which will be out shortly. Is it fall. out? This fall. Oh, will be awesome. out this fall. So um, we wanted to kind of talk about what that documentary is about and how she got the idea to produce and direct the film. Uh, she's going to give us the insights on that. But also, we have uh, one of my dear family members, my uncle. Chris Cone, or uncle in uh, by marriage at this point, right? Yes. So, <laughs> for you. You know, so also my investment banker. <laughs> Call him at Wells Fargo. Call him at Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's also part of the movie. Uh, he's actually the son of the main character that we're going to be talking about. Um, Ted Nagoy, Grandpa Ted. He is dubbed the Donut King. Uh, and we'll give it a little bit of a history and background of why he's called the Donut King. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get started. This is actually the first time we don't have our laptops with us. This yeah, no, very, I, this is very weird. Yeah, and, I, and I'm excited because I heard so much about this documentary um, and I was actually seeing a lot of uh, social media posts on it. So I didn't know if it was when it was going to come out. I heard South by Southwest and obviously everything happened. Uh, but I did start seeing advertisements. I didn't know exactly um, what the story was about until you didn't like, even know it was like my family. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know. Oh, no way. Yeah, that and was then, so cool. Yeah, and then Sappy, you know, uh, posted something on her Instagram, and I'm like, hey, are you related to this like thing? <laughs> like, she's like, yeah, that's my my grandpa, and I was like, what is going on? No so, way. yeah, really, really cool story. So, um, let let's just dig deep into yes. to what the Donut King is about. Um, so, Alice, if you want to share what the Donut King is about. The Donut King, it's about donuts, of course, <laughs> it's about donuts, um, but it is about Chris Uncle Combs' father, yep. Ted mm. Noy or Nagoy. Yeah. Um, so Ted, for people who live in Southern California, you may, have, may, not, may or may not have noticed that there's lots of donut shops. Yeah. A lot Time. of donut shops, tons, on every strip mall, every corner. You know, and I'm not talking about Yum Yum or Dunkin' Donuts or Krispy Kreme, I'm talking about like donuts or like Miss Donut or all these little mom and pop donut shops mm -hmm. and if you like donuts and you've gone and bought donuts you may have noticed that everyone is Asian yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> inside these yeah donut shops. yeah uh, and and in the case of some of our friends they're like oh well I've always knew they were Asian but I thought that was just my shop but then I didn't realize every shop had Asian uh, Asian donuts mm. so we have Ted Noy, the Donut King, to thank for that. Ted Noy was, is, uh, but he was a, a refugee to California in 1975. He was born and raised in, in Cambodia. And a bit of a, you know, I won't go too far into history lesson here, but there was unrest, civil war, Pol Pot, dictator, Khmer Rouge, genocide. Um, all of that happened in, 1975 is when it started and he was able to get out and it was the one and only time in US history that an American president issued an executive order to receive refugees into this country oh wow oh wow um, I know there was so much that I discovered in, yeah. in our in our own country's history in uncovering this story um, and it, so that was President Gerald Ford at the time okay. and you know this is on the tail end of the Vietnam War and this was Camp Pendleton, and they were given orders. They said, you have 24 hours. We're going to be receiving 50,000 refugees from Southeast Asia. Mm. And the soldiers, whether they liked it or not, and whatever their political belief, beliefs were at the time, they followed an order. And they erected camps, telecommunications, sanitation, food, cots. I mean, they, they received all these people, and Ted Noy was one of them. Mm. And he uh, arrived 
you know, scared, penniless. I mean, Cambodia is a tropical, lush country coming to California. It's a desert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was cold. I mean, completely different people. And he counted on the kindness of others. So that came in the form of a sponsor. And so Dean Beaumont sponsored him and his family. And he hustled. He, he got a job as he would do anything. It didn't matter. It did not matter who you were in Cambodia at the time. You scrub toilets, you do it. You mop floors, you do it. You work at a gas station, you do it. So he did all of that. He, he took three jobs, saved his money, and God, I'm sorry, I'm giving a very long answer here. No, no, <laughs> this is great. One of his jobs that he's hustling, uh, he worked at a gas station. Mm-hmm. And it's a, the night gas station attendant. And I mean it when he worked 24 hours a day to support his family. Is it the one on Tustin? On Tustin. Yeah, the one on Tustin, yeah. And from that gas station, it was a 24-hour gas station, and across the way was, it was actually a D-Case. It was a D-Case Donuts. Oh. And what he saw from that gas station, he's like, oh, God, it smells really good. You know, the, the smell keeps wafting over. But <laughs> what he also saw, that it was nonstop traffic. And being the shrewd businessman yeah. that he was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> non stop. Yeah. There's customers in and out. He's like, this is my way out of, out of like pumping gas for people. Yeah. So he went in and and said, can I get a job? And they're like, go train at Winchell's Donuts. Mm-hmm. And he became the first Asian to be accepted into the Winchell's Donuts manager program. Oh, cool! Oh, wow. I know. That's and then from from going into the program to being the manager of his first shop, it was only six months. Oh, wow! That's it. That was super fast. That was super fast. Super fast. For somebody who like barely spoke English, yep. uh, and you know, he was saying that they didn't normally accept applicants like him, hmm. but uh, they said he was particularly, you know, I don't know if aggressive is the right word, but aggressive. Yeah. Like he's yeah. like, he's like, dude, you have to, you cannot say no. Like he was just very persistent. I'm like, all right, okay. So he was the first Asian allowed in the Winchell's management program. That's a true answer. Crazy. True entrepreneur. True entrepreneur, yeah. And he took that and saved that and bought his first donut shop, second donut shop, third donut shop, on and on and on and on. So, question. So, how did you get a hold of this story? And then, when you got hold of it, when did you start thinking, like, I'm going to make a documentary and just research the entire thing? Like, how did this come about? So, it's a little interesting. I was a new mother at the time. I had a little baby. And I had a new nanny come. I was living in Santa Monica. And my husband went and bought from like this high-end bakery, he brought home some pastries. Mm-hmm. They were like very coveted, you know, these are like the high-end pastries. And he offered one to our nanny and she said, oh, no, thank you. I only eat Cambodian donuts. What? what are you about? I'm like, these are, these are from Huckleberry. These are like $5.50 each, you know? Like you're totally wow. thinking you have these like gourmet donuts. Yeah. And she's like, no, I'm good. I only eat Cambodian donuts. What are you talking about, you know? And, so we kind of like, I, unlike COVID times, I was very busy and I was constantly in and out. I was like, I don't even have time to address this question right now. And I'd come home for like a second. She's like, I found a Cambodian donut shop. And I was like, great. You know, and I'd leave. And I'm, as I'm driving away, I'm like, what is a Cambodian donut shop? <laughs> what is a Cambodian donut? How did she find a Cambodian donut shop? Uh-huh. I'm like, I've lived here for eight years. She's lived here for a week. She doesn't drive. Uh-huh. How has she found yeah. a Cambodian donut yeah. shop already? And then the next day, she had Cambodian donuts for my husband and I. Was it in a pink box? It was only two, so it was in a little wax, oh, like okay, a little okay, wax yeah, bag. Yeah. And she said, well, I got you Cambodian donuts. Okay. You know, so I took, <laughs> take the Cambodian donuts, and I take a bite. My husband takes a bite, and they're delicious and soft and fluffy. And we're like, this is really good. But I think this is a, a glazed donut, Just a right? glazed donut. <laughs> and, then, and she was like, yeah, but it's a Cambodian donut. I'm like, why is it Cambodian? This is like a glazed donut that I've seen since I was yeah, a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, well, it's Cambodian because Cambodian people make it. He said, but if Cambodian people make it, it's still an American donut. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, we're having this conversation. And she's like, no, but it's Cambodian. She's insisting that they're Cambodian. I'm like, no, they're American. And she says, no, look it up. It's like Cambodian donuts. You can tell they're they're fresher, they're less sweet, they're fluffier. Oh, interesting. And I wanted to prove her wrong or to, I didn't like, what are you talking about? So I Google, like, I'm just like on my phone and I Google it. All these articles come up. 
LA Times 1985, LA Times 1992, LA Times, da da da, like all of these different articles. This is why your donut boxes are pink, from rags to riches. Oh, wow. wow. The 92 article from the LA Times was says, oh, the fall from, you know, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, had yeah. A, he has he's had a bit of a up and down, up and down yeah. kind of a life. But of course, that's what captivated these headlines captivated me. I'm like, this is why our, our donut boxes are pink. And this is the story of one man, the refugee who did it. And I read every article that I could and I was completely fascinated and I was dumbfounded that I didn't know this story and I and being Asian I was like oh my god this is so cool and I said I somebody's got to make a movie about this guy uh-huh. yeah. and I was like I think I want to make this <laughs> I think I want to do <laughs> why, why can't I do it <laughs> yeah and crazily enough uh, I decide to call I'm like okay so cold calling sucks right yeah 100% it sucks Anyway, you slice it or dice it. And then just like me being Asian and like knowing, trying to get other Asian people who are not born here, trying to cold call, you're yeah. bound to reach a lot of dead ends. Yeah. Like a lot of no's. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh God, I guess I'm just gonna have to cold call DK's Donuts in Santa Monica. You know, I just call like the spot. And to my surprise, a girl with perfect English picks up the phone, and then you do the awkward like, "Hey, um, so my name is Alice. I'm a filmmaker. You don't know me, but like, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to make a movie." And you just, you know, this, this awkward cold call pitch. Yeah. And she says, "Okay, well, you've called the right place, and you've called the right person. Ted is my great uncle. Okay. I can help you. Are you on Facebook?" And she connected us. Got it. Straight. And that was complete kismet because she's not always at the store. And if anybody else had picked up the phone that day at DK's, it would have been, been, it been, it yeah, been no. no. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have thought to call back. You know? I think about that all the time. Yes. That would have been a no. I'd be like, oh, God, and dead ends. How am I going to find this guy? Yeah. They may not even speak English. Or they may not even speak English. Exactly. <laughs> so it's the, the stars really aligned to tell this story. So you connected with how many family members to create the documentary? Uh, or the fri- fi- friends as well, too, I guess. The family is very large. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> the family is very large. And um, so it was, and it was also confusing for me at the very beginning because everybody's uncle and everybody's aunt. <laughs> very and everybody On the way here. So I'm like, who is, I'm like, so he is your uncle. She's like, okay. And, and yes, everybody's uncle and everybody's auntie. Yeah, yes. it's still confusing. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't blame you. Um, so I connected with Mei Li. So she is the donut princess. She calls herself the donut princess of LA. And Ted is the great uncle. So then I connected with Ted. Ted put me in touch with Chris. Um, from Chris, then I met Chet, and I met Savvy, and I met Christy. Gosh, and then met Susan and mm-hmm. her daughter Amanda. Met Adam Vaughn. Mm-hmm. Gosh. Met Ted's cousin, who is uh, Chai Boon, and his daughters, Linda and Annette. So I feel like it's a fraction of the family, yeah. but it was still pretty vast. I couldn't include any more characters without making the story very yeah. diluted. So Uncle Kong, when Alice you know, got a hold of you, what were your initial thoughts? Mm-hmm. Um, we, were, we were flattered, number one. Um, but of course, everything had to yeah. So, and at the time, he was here visiting, wasn't he? He's was still in Cambodia. I met him when he came. He oh, was when here, he came, he but we spoke before. He was here two, before. Or three, or right, right, right. two or three weeks So, later. you know, I, I told, I reached out to him, and he was excited and all that. Okay. But remember, there was someone else in the picture. Um, I know. We're very thankful, just so you yeah. know, for the record, because I think if we stuck with the initial plan, we'd probably still be in the planning phase. So, so anyways, someone else was in the picture trying to do the same thing. Oh, and then interesting. Alice, Alice came on board and pitched, and then when my dad came to visit, uh, what year was that? 20, 17 or 18? 18. Maybe 18. He came to visit, and that's when we set up a, a meeting to meet Alice, and we all loved her, you know, the whole family, my wife, and, you know, my dad. And so that's when my dad decided, you know, I really want to work with Alice. Oh, wow. So. So our first, 
we connected by Facebook. We just like Facebook Messenger. And then he says, hey, can we like talk on the phone? And I said, yeah, of course. So we did a little Facebook audio. And it was so funny. His English is great. You know, perfect English. Oh, wow. And he asked a question. So he's like, oh, OK, Alice, so you're like a, a director in Hollywood. And I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you're like a director. I'm like, yeah. Santa Monica. And um, and and he said, okay, so you're like a, you're like American. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, like uh, like like white, American. And I said, I, I said actually no, I'm I'm Chinese. And he's like, oh really? He's like, I'm Chinese. I'm like, you are? And he, he's like, yeah. He's like, my mother's Chinese. He's like, I'm Chinese. I. I speak Ma Mandarin. I said, I speak Mandarin. And so we started speaking in Mandarin. Oh, cool. And I feel like that broke the ice yes. instantly. Awesome. And we started talking. And there were so many parallels. Again, my, I, my family is not Cambodian, but it was in communist China, coming here, then building from nothing, giving us all that we wanted. And there were so many commonalities. And then being able to speak in the mother tongue was just another kind of like level of trust and understanding so that was it ended up being super super helpful but, but at the same time my dad's not a hard guy to talk to oh your dad is <laughs> yeah. like he's super he can talk to your anybody, dad anybody. <laughs> yeah. so he's very charismatic I, I will say that i've never met anyone the in most. my life yeah. quite like yeah, Ted yeah he's, he's <laughs> one in many. <laughs> sure, uh, just, i love her mainly's mom yeah. chuang we actually do we well. love her and she said you know Ted Noi." He can sell snow to an Eskimo. Oh, wow. I, I believe that. <laughs> and I said, I believe that. I've used that that uh, comparison. And I said, I believe I, that. I'm like, that is so true. Mm -hmm. yep. He can sell snow to an Eskimo. Perhaps. Yeah. And so I guess for me, did you ever read the book, The Donut King? There's a book? Yeah. That's I, how I knew the entire story because of the book. Oh, yeah. Here. The book came out, it was, again, it was Kismet. Every, the stars had aligned book hadn't been published yet so this was like in April oh, and he was coming a few for weeks later purpose. for a yeah. book launch yes yes and I said I can't believe this so then I actually have source material wow yeah so I was just going off of like the articles that I read but right. then having that book was invaluable as, right. again that was like a the bible that we always went back to yeah, because I, I was reading it, I was going through all these like business trips and that was like my time to read the book and he knows like I would text him just feeling so inspired because I'm like, I would, I'm going home like, Grandpa Ted did this? Like, like he went and, uh, yeah. like, he went and like, gave all these families like a donut shop and he didn't have to pay them until they made a profit. Like, that to me, I was because we, our history together is we went door to door. Yeah. For like years. And we know how hard that is. Yeah, that's, that's why we're, okay. we're friends. Yeah. Right? yeah. Apparently. Making unfortunately. more sense. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And you know, so we, we, we understand the hustle and reading that book and, and I go, and he didn't, and he wanted to save people from the regime. He wanted to bring them here and give them a better life. That to me was like was, the best thing that I've read. It's so, I mean, his story is so good and it's so good yes. to tell because it is so complex. It, it is, yes. It is so complex because if it is just the story about a saint, that's also not that interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, well, like if somebody's just like so perfect and you're watching like, Okay, like I get, it. get this, it. This person's perfect. <laughs> crazy. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would be like but like yeah. this guy, he's like, oh, he's got flaws just like me. You know, and I feel like that's what connects the most to an audience is when somebody is imperfect, um, but aspirational and inspirational yes. too. Yes. And I, you know, I got that 100% from, from Ted. If they're too perfect, then they're just annoying. Right. You know. <laughs> so is this like, is it, is the Donut King documentary just, is that the sort of film that you, tend to produce and tend to make? Like, do you, do, do you make documentaries or you know, do you make other films? This was, it was my first full length doc. Wow. Oh, you know, wow. I've been, I've been busy making commercials and I've been busy as a DP before this, that stands for director of photography, cinematographer, for a lot of the documentary greats. And that's like Maury Kennedy, Werner Herzog, Stacey Peralta. And I, so I, I've learned from the greats yeah. in the business. Um, and, you know, it's like your, you know, it's fate. You know, I guess Ted would really, this is your fate. Like, life finds you. And this story, I feel like, found me whether I wanted to avoid it or not. You know, the story really found me. And it, yeah, it was just, um, it was everything that I love. A, a 
it's really what I, what what I'm attracted to is character and really a character story and a character's arc in life. Were there any struggles um, you know, making this film? Any challenges? Any challenges that you ran across? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, well, she flew to Cambodia. Too. You did. Oh, you did. Yeah, oh. I flew to Cambodia yeah. twice. I was going to ask how you were able to do that. Uh, flew to Cambodia twice. Um, you know, it's it's also not always easy to ask somebody to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars to go and make a movie. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Especially this was my first film, so you know, I'm I know me and I'm confident in my abilities. But if I'm talking to someone like, hey, you want to write me a check yeah. for like four hundred thousand dollars or something, <laughs> yeah. like. It's not that easy, yeah. Yeah. you know, or, all, um, or they're like, oh, yeah, sure. There were times they're like, oh, yeah, sure. And they're like, okay, the money will hit your account in 10 days. Really? We're like, great. And then 10 days go by and we're like, where's the, where's oh. the money? You know? <laughs> and then at this point, um, I mean, this actually happened. There was a point that they're like, the money will hit your account in 10 days. We're like, great. Well, let's get going on this. And then Jose and I started personally financing it. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Because the money would be there in 10 days. We'd pay ourselves back. The money never came. Wow. And so we like... We did that for a few months. <laughs> we're like, and then at this point, we're so invested in it. We're like, mm-hmm. I can't stop now. Like, we're we're like so into it. Like, we're like part of the family. Like, we feel yeah. like we're so uh, like ingrained in the family. Absolutely. And we're talking to Ted every day. We're like, how do we like? We just had to keep the faith, and it happened. Yeah, because one of the things that how this all came about was we had a podcast, and we were we started talking about it during his his episode and off offline after the after we shot and he goes hey you should really talk to alice and and really do the, the donut king episode for you guys but at that at literally that was our second episode at that time we were still trying to figure out like yeah. what we're about right. and like yeah. how and our we, identity our identity like our content like you know and i was like i don't think we're ready for that yet because that's kind of like a big deal documentary <laughs> you know episode but it was one of the things that i one of the episodes that I really wanted to showcase because one, I'm close to them. And number two, I wanted to really help promote this movie, mm-hmm. this documentary, just because of grandpa's story. And just like what you said, there's two sides to him, right? There's the perfect side and there's the, the, the imperfect side. And showing that and showing the, the rise and the struggle and the rise back, I mean, it, it does tend to relate to a lot of people. And I, we both love anything that's inspiring and aspiring and help people move especially with their emotions yep. that's the process. that's the, pro- the yes. process is what we love mm-hmm. on how they got there you know i've learned so much about um people you know i've learned a lot about myself and what makes you know what i've again i've said i i love what makes things very exciting for me is is people mm-hmm. right and I, I i love the humanity and telling the human side of everything and there is actually a day that I was running in Santa Monica. And, and you know, you can, it's very easy, you know, when things are like, oh, you know, that person like stole or this person did whatever. And it's going, oh, that's so bad. Like, what a terrible person. I would never do that, right? But I, on this journey, Ted was born like in super poverty in this like tiny village there's like without paved roads, no shoes, no future. And like from a kid, he knew that he wanted more than this. He was like, I, I'm destined for more than like this tiny little village life. And I feel like it's so easy to cast judgment when let's say you were born like really comfortable, you've never been hungry. Like when you're born poor, you do anything to get food. Yeah. You'll do anything to not be poor anymore. <clears throat> And I feel like that helped me really understand people's motivations. Like I was, like I was saying, I was on this run in Santa Monica, and somebody had built this like new spec home that was like millions of dollars. And as I was running past, the door was open, and I was like, "Oh, look, the door's open!" You know, and not for a second did I even think I was like, oh, "I'm gonna go inside and see if there's anything <laughs> I could take," you know. But that's because I've never needed it. Yeah. I've never needed to go and be like, "Oh, there's nothing more." Yeah. Like, because I've never been hungry. Fortunately, you know, thank the Lord. Yeah. But someone who is, and you go, oh man, that person went in that house, and like, you think that person's hungry? They'll do anything to feed their kid. There's motivations, and I feel like that is such a complex and beautiful like character study to not be so quick to judge people 
on their decisions. It was actually an interview that I had with Ted. Do you remember like a couple years ago, there was like the migrant caravan is coming from, is moving through Central America and the migrant caravan is gonna end up at our border and the migrant caravan is full of like rapists and thieves and murderers. I, know, I, know. I do remember that. Yeah. It was like all these people from Central America who were like, we just wanna get to the US and it was on the news as like, these are horrible people. And Jose and I were like, what if there's like an Uncle Ted in that yeah. caravan? Like people are just yeah, trying yeah, yeah, to be yeah. like, I need to get out of El Salvador. And you know, this isn't meant to be political, but it was just like, there could be like somebody in there. And I asked Ted during one of our interviews and I said, hey, you were a refugee and you came and you succeeded, you built bridges in the community. You've actually completely changed the entire landscape of donuts. In not only just Southern California, but like in the entire like west coast of the United States. So what would you say, you know, to the migrant caravan that that it's full of thieves and murderers? You know, and Ted said he's like, you know, you don't know what people have to do when they're hungry, and you have to save your kid. Yeah. Like Ted didn't even be like, oh, they're not murderers and they're not rapists, yeah. and they're, they're not um, thieves. He was like, you, you don't know what those people are up against. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that was not the ex answer I was expecting from him, and. God, if it came time to like protecting my kid, mm -hmm. yeah, I would murder him yeah. if someone was coming after him. So that would technically make me a murderer all of a sudden. Yeah. But uh, am I a bad person? I don't. I hope not. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, there's so much gray. It's, everything's not just so black and white when it comes to survival and what you have to do. Yeah, that perception, perception as well too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Alice, what we're going to do is we're going to take a uh, short break. Um, and then uh, for all the listeners out there, obviously, as you get to hear this story, this is a story that I, I think anybody should watch and, and learn, yeah. um, especially from an immigrant family like, you know, that yes. is, like, yeah, like my, my parents, I think about them and like it tears me up, that, you know, knowing like what they were, did for me and, and obviously I have a better opportunity because of them. So it's just an inspirational story. So when we come back, we're going to talk with uh, the producer, director, of the Donut King, Alice, and then obviously Uncle Cole. <laughs> you are listening to Kickspot.